I'm director here at the UCL Institute of Education, and it's my pleasure to be introducing today's event. Um, it's lovely to see so many people here, and thanks for braving the freezing cold, those of you who have come from outside <coughs> UCL, and I see that many of you have. I know that we're all very much looking forward to hearing what's been said, and what um, I have taken really as a wake-up call to the sector, a wake-up call to all of the, us individually who work within it, and almost a kind of um, timely reframing, actually. You know, those of us in um, UK higher education have been met, met with a sort of set of mini-crises or shocks recently, haven't we? We've first of all, of course, Brexit, then we've got these agendas around tech and so on, and a whole new set of indicators to play with and uh, games and drivers that we've all got to engage with. And yet, I think what Simon's book really successfully does is put all this into perspective globally, radically, asking what are the big questions in our sector at the moment and thinking about the real role of higher education in an incredibly powerfully evidenced way. So a real challenge, I think, and a real contribution uh, to the field. We're going to hear from two speakers. First of all, uh, Dr. Dame Nicola Brewer, who I'll introduce in just a second. And secondly, of course, Simon himself. And I'll introduce both. We'll hear from Nicola first, and then I'll introduce Simon. So Dame Nicola is Vice Provost International at UCL, and she's then responsible for our global engagement strategy, but she's also a brilliant advocate and supervisor for our work here at the IOE. Before joining UCL in May 2014, Nicola was a British diplomat at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and she was British High Commissioner to South Africa, Lesotho and Swaziland from May 2009 to September 2013. And as many of us know, um, Nicola was also chief executive, uh, chief executive of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, um, the first, and a role that she held until 2009. So as you can see, she's got huge cross-sectoral experience, and as I've already learned uh, in my work with her, huge wisdom. And I'm really looking forward to her analysis, so please, Nicola. Thank you very much, Gretchen. Uh, I was working on wisdom, but anyway, we'll we'll continue. But uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here uh, this evening. Uh, I grab every opportunity I can to come over to uh, the IOE, um, and I think I can claim credit for being the first person to say you've got to have a launch of this book here at the IOE in London. Why let Melbourne have all the credit? So um, I need to declare another interest. I'm on the advisory uh, board of the Centre for Global Higher Education, and I believe passionately in the work that centre is doing. It's already started, even though it's really quite new, it's already started to do fabulous research, and I think it's as important to spread that research as, as to do it, and I'm very keen to play my part in, in doing a little bit of that. Um, so I was given a, a PDF copy of this book to take away over Christmas. Um, see, it joined my Christmas reading pile that was on my on my um, and the it had to compete with the six shortlisted novels of the Man Booker Files. So when I tell you that I found it more riveting uh, and more and more readable than Paul Beatty's The Sellout, uh, and it actually stopped me starting. Deborah Levy's Hot Milk, and I've read her earlier novels, I think she's fabulous. I hope you'll get a sense of how riveting and how good a read and how thought-provoking it is. And that's why I wanted to buy a copy of the book, as well as having it on, on PDF. So there's still, you know, buy now while starting last is what I would, I would say. And I think there's a discount this evening, so well, well worth doing that. So I've got huge interest in and sympathy for Simon's argument, expressed very clearly in this book, that governments, especially in English-speaking countries, expect both too much and too little of higher education. 
And I do really share his view that we mustn't let higher education's contribution to the common good continue to be chipped away at without, without challenge. And I think this book, as Becky said, um, it, it kind of throws down the gauntlet in a very elegant academic fashion. There were lots of fascinating bits in the book. Um, I laughed out loud at bits of the chapter about, uh, it was critiquing uh, university-wide league tables, uh, both for their methodology and their <laughs> impact on, on, on behaviour. And I think that chapter will find uh, a very sympathetic audience in lots of uh, university circles. But the theme in the book that resonates mostly with me, and it's for reasons that Becky's already alluded to, are the ones that are around social justice. So as soon as I saw the title of the book, I wanted to, to read it. I, I ended up at the Equality and Human Rights Commission because I spotted an ad in The Economist, and it said, do you want to join the next adventure in social justice? And I was, I was, I was hooked. Um, I think the search for social justice has got harder, uh, and we need to look, uh, we need to explore all the all the avenues that we can. So, the topic of the book, the title of the book, is 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 hugely hugely topical, and it, it should be even more even more so. Simon's preface talks a bit about um, completing the final version in the immediate aftermath of the 23 June uh, referendum. He talks, he refers to um, the rejection of the views of experts, and he talks a bit about how perhaps universities got lumped together with the EU and with, and with London as beneficiaries of, of <coughs> income inequality. You could say, and I think the book sets this out, I think this is a direct quote, that higher education is maybe paying the price for its association with elite formation um, and with a relatively recent emphasis on the private economic benefits of, of degrees. So, one of the central tenets in the book, and I'm looking here to check that we read it properly, is that unless Anglo-American universities begin to deal with um, the contribution they might be making to social inequality, then higher education will both fail to fulfil its potential for the common good, and it will remain vulnerable to popular resentment. Um, and almost paradoxically, as there's higher participation in education, perhaps there's an element of growing resentment for the declining proportion, still a big proportion, uh, of people who don't access it. So Simon's book points up the really sharp uh, fundamental policy choice between a high participation education system, which is provided on a common good basis, and one that is competitive and, and stratified. I, I wondered for a while early on, uh, I hadn't got very far into the book before I realised I was wrong, but I wondered if it was going to be a bit utopian. I don't think it's a utopian <coughs> book at all. He, uh, Simon and the, and the book state really clearly how um, positional ambition is normal for all families and all societies. And what he in this book is interested in is how um, the education system is configured in relationship with that normal, and why, in particular, the US and the UK systems have failed to sustain that link, which I think was there in the 1960s. I'm not sure I can remember in detail personally, but I was <coughs> quite a child of the 60s. But um, uh, that, that, they spoke to that vision of higher education and the, and the common good, perhaps at a time when um, the larger social context really favoured high social mobility. So Simon argues that when um, private goods become more important, this begins to kind of crowd out the space for public goods, or at least for middle class support for them. The book puts it really snappily, and I like this, um, where it, it, Simon says, no one wants to pay twice the same kind of good, once for the private good, and again for someone else's public good. I'm not 100% sure I agree with that. Um, I don't think it always has to hold true. I think it depends on the amount of social cohesion and <laughs> related political farsightedness. Um, things that universities can contribute to, but not on their own, uh, determine. But whatever, family background is always going to be important. So 
and, and this is this is one of the arguments of the book that really really speaks to me. The task of schools and universities is to ensure that um, they can make a difference for for larger numbers of less privileged students. And I love this phrase: widening the passages for mobility. So I would say it, I was thinking about it through my head. It fits with some other stuff I've been reading about. How do you help people build social capital if they don't already have access to that through their, through their family structures? Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that this book ends on an optimistic note. Um, it uh, uh, talks about the relationship between public and private goods not having to be a zero sum game. I, in lots of fields, have always looked for, so what's the, uh, what's the solution that isn't zero sum? Why does X always have to come at the expense of Y? So I'm going to quote the final sentence. I couldn't find it in the book, but I know it's in the PDF, so I'm sure it's here. So Simon wrote, when the private goods produced in higher education are nested in the framework of a common good approach, these private goods can be maximised for all. And that sounds <coughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Dave Nicola. Um, and now for me to introduce the author. So Simon Margison is Professor of International <coughs> Higher Education here at the UCL IOE. Um, and he's director of the ESRC Hefty Funded Centre for Global Higher Education. And um, that is a centre, of course, as you know, of global repute and outstanding international excellence, of which we at the IOE are extremely proud. Um, the Centre for Global Higher Education is a research partnership of three UK universities and eight international universities, and has over just, just over £6 million in funding to carry out 15 projects in relation to global, national and local aspects of higher education. And many colleagues from the centre are here today and I'm sure will be very glad to talk to you all about those activities um, and the centre more broadly. Uh, Simon himself is also Joint Editor-in-Chief of Higher Education <coughs> Journal and prior to joining the UCL IOE, he was pre Professor of Higher Education at the University of Melbourne. As you know, he's an enormously respected scholar who absolutely leads the field of higher education studies. So we're all here to hear him, and without further ado, sign. Well, thank you, Becky. Thank you very much. And thank you, Nicola, for those most generous words. And much appreciated, both of you. Uh, I want to also thank Carolyn Gallup uh, and Anna Phillips, who've who really made this launch happen and made it possible um, to do it so well. Um, and, th and thank you all for coming. I mean, it's, very, it's very generous of you to give up the winter, the winter evening. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my, my wife Anna, who's here, and my daughter Anna Rosa, who's sitting next to her. Um, my family was a fundamental, of course, to this book, as is often the case. And um, I think the, the what I put them through was rather strange. Um, in this um, eight-day immersion at the end of July, sort of the last week of July, a quarter of the book was written. Um, all the chapters were pulled into shape. I mean, really, there was nothing in chapter, exactly in chapter form at the beginning of that week. And the publisher's deadline was met. Um, it was exhausting and it was exhilarating. I remember saying to my wife that on the second last day that Looking up at her when she came in in the morning and, and to the desk where I was working, I said to her, I feel I'm at the, like I'm at the bottom of a very deep well looking up at the sky. <laughs> That's exactly how it felt. But we got there, and <coughs> ten, ten hours after the end of the composition of the book, and after sending it to the publisher on time, how amazing, we left for summer in Italy, so all was well. Um, now, the book is about the expansion of higher education across the world. Um, the stratification of participation that often ex attends expansion and to some extent is generated by the motors of growth, um, but, so, but shows itself more in some countries than others. And it's also about the <coughs> problems of Anglo-American inequality, which are only partly sourceable to growth. They're also about changes in wage determination, changes in taxation, and indeed in the philosophy of, of government. 
At last count, UNESCO identified 208 million students in tertiary education, two-thirds at degree level. World enrolment has doubled in 15 years. More than one person in every three around the world now goes into tertiary education, and the majority of those complete a degree. This vast spread of inclusion is joined to the process of urbanisation and the growth of the global middle class, especially in three of the four most populous countries, China, India and Indonesia. Now, as you know, higher education, which, which as it grows, comes to resemble more closely the societies that nested, uh, as ambiguous possibilities in relation to social inequality and, and equality. But there's no doubt that higher education higher educated societies are, are better off in many ways, individually and collectively. Although less so for those outside higher education, and that's one of our problems. Now you have to resist the instinct to say when you think about the times we're in, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. There you are, I've said it. Um, <laughs> now for HEIs in the English speaking countries, um, despite their prolific world role, <coughs> these are confusing and difficult times. The new potency of a populist alt-right, little interested in education for its own sake, mistrustful of experts and science, radically indifferent to the benefits of global people mobility, and positioning universities and graduates as part of the problem, despite the great democratisation of participation that's occurred, is a challenge for us. It's a sign of the new centrality of higher education that the divide between the tertiary educated and the less educated has become a potent political factor. When only 10% of people are in HE, it's impossible to mobilise that divide to secure an electoral advantage. <coughs> but when participation reaches a third or more and goes towards half of the electorate, it's another matter. You can create a political polarisation around the educated versus the non-educated. And in both Brexit and the US election, the most influential factor was not class or income. There was an SES mixture of support on both sides. Perhaps in the Trump election, his, uh, his, elect his electoral support was slightly wealthier than Clinton's. Perhaps in the Brexit vote, the, the uh, Remain side was slightly wealthier than the Leave side. So it played in different directions. But other factors were more important. I mean, gender and ethnic identity had a huge, I say ethnic identity rather than race, that, that, American terminology, had a huge uh, impact in the United States election. And in both countries, there were two factors that were even stronger than those two. One was location. Now, Brexit and Trump were overwhelmingly supported in small towns and rural areas and generally opposed in large cities, often by very sizable margins. The other factor was higher education in the American terminology, possessing a college degree. In the UK, 26% of degree holders voted for leave, but 78% of people without qualifications. In the US election, again, the, uh, the education factor was even larger than the race and gender factor. <laughs> the only category of white voters who supported Clinton were college educated women. Now note that those two factors are connected. Higher education is located in cities. And of course, participation in higher education is much higher in cities. Now, we can detect, I think, three underlying explanations for Brexit and the Trump ascendancy. All, I think, have some implications for higher education, and all, I might say, connect to our research projects and activity for global higher education. First, there's, there's clearly a resistance to open borders that was greater than it was five or ten years ago. But it's not just amongst those struggling for a job. There is some, I think, in the elite who've come to believe that, that open, unlimited globalisation, open borders, free trade, is no longer necessarily in their interest. The reasoning goes like this. I mean, yes, we can limit international students. But if we do that, we'll drive down export earnings. That's a bad thing, of course. On the other hand, open borders are a serious risk. And perhaps the open border regime, the open trading regime is facilitating the rise of China and India at our expense. And I've heard the argument put in the United States, why should we train so many Chinese students who are just going to go back and compete with us for global leadership? Um, now, behind the new protectionism, which is more evident, I think, in the United States than it is here, um, lie memories of empire, 
and in the United States, fears of having to share global leadership. Now, it's easy for politicians to tap into both the, the resistance to open borders, the competition for labour uh, that drives that below, and also tap into the, sh the, the Tory shires, the, the, you know, the east of England, the south of England, where amongst the less educated, uh, wealthier people, there's, uh, there's, there's also strong support for Brexit. Second, resistance to multiple identity. The deep tensions that lie between global mobility and cosmopolitan ease. And on one hand, an ethnic nationalism of the blood and soil variety on the other. Now, ethnic nationalism and imperial glory, <coughs> it's a potent mix. Yet, this mix has really got nowhere to go except to foster division with imagined enemies. I mean, global convergence and partial world integration will continue regardless. I've just read the OECD's uh, summary of migration for 2016, and the clear message is that migration continues to increase, and in the majority of, of, uh, of high-income countries are becoming less restrictive rather than more restrictive in relation to the regulation of migration. To some extent, we are outliers in the level of, of, of migration resistance and the degree to which that is now influencing policy. Nonetheless, um, you know, there is a rise, as the OECD notes, in resistance to migration in many countries. The problem is that regardless of that, of that resistance, migration will continue to increase. And it's economically and socially impossible to radically reverse it for long in any one country. So, and the UK government, of course, is well aware of that. And that was what the thing that prevented Cameron from fulfilling the promise of cutting migration to tens of thousands. The, the, the secular tendencies that, dri that were driving migration were simply too, too important, too large. <coughs> so the government is battered hither and thither by popular opposition to migration, especially at the cities in both Tory and, and, and Labor circles, while at the same time business is still pushing back against that, demanding a, its right to employ migrant labour. And, and families are, are coming together across borders and people are finding a way through the, the regulation, the thicket of regulations that, that, that regulate people movement. Now all of this is a recipe for unstable policy and often no policy at all. Are foreign students going to be in or out of the count? Are we going to cut foreign student numbers? Are we going to cut them by 40%? We still don't really know. The third element is resistance to economic and social inequality. Partly deregulated trading markets, markets and incomes have concentrated wealth. Neoliberal austerity has weakened social protection against that shift in the market. Life for many people is more precarious. Higher education alone cannot sustain social mobility, not when many families still face barriers to entry, and when higher education is becoming more stratified in value. Even as higher education expands, the intense social competition for entry into the good institutions and the competition between HEIs reduces the scope of the possible social benefits. And these are further narrowed by policy's emphasis on private goods, the rate of salary and employability to justify high tuition in the market model. Policy neglects the common social benefits of higher education and research, especially for people who are not enrolled. When public goods in higher education are underplayed, and under monitored and under financed, it's hardly surprising they're unknown in the electorate. And there were strong votes for Lee in the rural areas adjacent to the great universities in the North and Midlands. The sector has been positioned as an elite playground, though graduate returns are quite dispersed by field, by institution, and by region, and often family is more potent than higher education in determining life chances. Higher education and the common good attempts to address this predicament. To some extent, I think we are culpable in elevating private goods at the expense of public goods, rather than in concert with public goods, as Nicholas said. HEIs celebrate when they displace each other in the league tables. They want high rates of return for their degrees, but high rather than moderate rates of return increase the gulf between the educated and the uneducated and are a sign of an unequal society. You do not see these high, rate, high rates of return differentials in the German and the Nordic systems, and yet they're comfortable about the quality of their higher education systems by and large. And HEIs are mostly tolerant of intensive competition and stratification, 
the vertical <coughs> stretching of the system in terms of value and resources and esteem. Although, to be fair to us all, it's difficult from a single institution to get a handle on the process of system organisation. But when the competitive struggle of families determines opportunity, those with starting advantages tend to come out on top. And HE's, HE worsens social inequality rather than correcting it. The possibility begins to receive of a common good solution, more like the Nordic or the German or the Korean, South Korean systems perhaps, in which all places seem to confer tangible value. All seem to provide a solid education, whether they're demonstrably elite or mass institutions in academic terms. There seems to be no essential trade-off between access and quality, and HDIs and society seem to find a way to pursue private and public good at the same time. Now, public goods, goods are goods that, which in economic terms are subject to market failure because they're not rivalrous or not, and or not excludable, or they're goods that in political terms are shaped by state policy, regulation or financing. Individual public goods include enhanced graduate health outcomes and greater civic and political participation by graduates. Some public goods spill over from private investment in education, but arguably not enough public goods will appear that way because of the market failure problem. Government intervention is especially essential for the production of collective goods, goods such as the contribution of research to global knowledge, hence research, basic research is everywhere funded as a public good, and also goods like social and scientific <coughs> literacy and the capacity to respond productively to globalisation and technological change. Above all, there is higher education's contribution to our sociability, to relational society. As Adam Smith put it in the Theory of Moral Sentiments, published in 1759, all members of human society stand in need of each other's assistance. Humanity, justice, generosity and public spirit are the qualities most useful to others. I define common goods as the contributions of HE to broadly distributed opportunity, to equality of respect and material circumstance, and to factors that cohere communities, including intercultural capability and tolerance within a common framework of human rights and mutual support. So, higher education and the common good focuses on the public and common goods in national higher education systems as one solution to the growing Anglo-American social and economic inequality. It critiques individualistic readings of human capital theory and the winner-loser model of higher education as a competitive market. And high, high institutional stratification and ranking that limits the distribution of private as well as public goods. It argues that although HE is not a primary driver of inequality, it does have a key potential role in enhancing social mobility, and in some countries demonstrably does this, and also in rebuilding social solidarity in fractured societies. Here I think we can be optimistic. Brexit and the US election confirms that higher educated people have more personal agency and confidence <coughs> in the face of economic, technological and social change and are more tolerant in the face of migration in multiple cultures. The continuing expansion of HE will shrink the potential support base of the old right. Only 27% of 18 to 24 year olds, the most educated UK generation in history, supported Lee. To sustain expansion, it's essential though that mass higher education is not emptied out of value in a highly stratified setting. And I think this has been happening in the United States where the enrollment rate has been trending downwards as the community colleges <coughs> seem to become less, success, less accessible and also less valuable. However, the more that higher education functions as an inclusive common good, the greater <coughs> its potential um, to to generate positive social, economic and political effects. Don't forget to access the book, either by buying a copy or by accessing the book using the URL. I think we're in the age where most books are going to be distributed through, um, through screen. Thank you very much for coming <coughs> and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening and we have quite a lot of wine and we welcome you to drink. Thank you. <laughs>